Okay. Okay. Got it. All right. So my first question is, how did you get the job on Springer? Uh, well, yeah, that's a good story in and of itself. <laughs> I appreciate you having me on. This is a really awesome. Uh, um, but yeah, I was uh, working in the gentleman's club uh, world in Elgin, Illinois, and uh, just a regular Tuesday night. And the reason I remember it was a Tuesday night is because it was amateur night. That was Tuesday nights. And I was the manager, the general manager of Blackjacks out in Elgin. And uh, two people walked in, a guy and a girl. And, you know, can I, can I talk to a manager? I'm like, yeah, what can I do for you? And they're like, well, we're from the Jerry Springer show. And just wondering if you have any stories that might be want to be on the show. And I, I just looked at him and I said, well, that's my girlfriend who was on stage. Who was my girlfriend? And I said, she's, uh, you know, and that's her girlfriend. That's our girlfriend over there. And it was another girl. But I think she's, they're both cheating on me with the DJ who's a, my best friend. And I think he's having sex with both of them behind my back. And I don't like that. So I'm going to beat the hell out of him on the stage. And he's like, dude, for real? You'll do that for us? I'm like, only if she does amateur night. And he's like, and he looked at her and he goes, guess what you're doing? She's like, what? <laughs> he's like, you're doing amateur night. I'm like, perfect. Then we'll do the show. And uh, literally we were guests on the show and did the show. And uh, that producer liked me and called me back and said, you got any more stories? I said, dude, I got all the stories you can handle, man. Just let me know what you need and I'll provide it. So about six weeks of doing that for the show, I got drunk with him after one of the shows. It was really good. And uh, we were in a limo and he, and he goes, do you want a job? And I said, don't, don't say it unless you mean it, man. He's like, yeah, yeah, we, I, you know, you should come work here, like for real. We're gonna, I'm gonna send a limo. Just wear a suit to the interview. We're gonna send a limo for you because that's what they did. You know, they sent limos for me because I'd go downtown for the show and I lived way out in Elgin. So uh, every show that I helped produce, which was me find the people at that point, they'd send a limo for me and uh, I would go in there. But they sent the limo. I showed up in my suit, talked to uh, the our our recording producer, the same girl who put those tote marks on the board. She already knew who I was, and she's like, you're hired as an associate producer. I was like, sweet, I'll see you Monday. And uh, I started as an associate producer <laughs> and realized it was a lot of freaking work, man. <laughs> it was a lot of work. It was the most work I've ever been around. It was 100 hours, 80 to 100 hours a week, and people are like, there is no way. And I'm like, God, I'm telling you, I it was 80 to 100 hours a week. Oh, geez. I'm telling you, I stay in the office sometimes all night all night and all the next day and then about six weeks later after i helped put up some killer shows uh some of the most iconic famous shows in, in jerry springer's history really uh they said well you want to you think you could do it on your own i'm like i'm ready let's do this and they promoted me to a producer so in a matter of about uh two about six eight weeks maybe two and a half months i went from working in the gentleman's club world to all, having a glass office right across from jerry springer so i'm like what is going on <laughs> <laughs> well all right man life is crazy and yeah. uh, i did, did that for two years this is 98 to 2000 because i remember producing when it was uh, the millennium when it changed and i thought all the computers were going to go off so i had a big party at one of our hotels the executive plaza downtown and i had a big party two rooms open the doors i said man i'm gonna work tomorrow all the computers are gonna go down. so and then i woke up the next day like, damn it didn't happen so i, had right. one. I remember and then i i stopped being a producer about april probably and uh richard dominic really liked me because i was honest uh, i put up a i was putting up crap shows my heart wasn't in it anymore i respected the show too much i respected richard dominic too much and i was done man i was done 80 to 100 hours a week caught up to me i was just done dealing with these people uh the guests that came on the show and i was just like i walked in after and i knew i got called into his office and i knew nothing this was not good so i walked in and i was like and before he could start yelling at me, I was like, listen, before you start yelling at me, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm not giving you 100%. And I respect you guys too much for that. And you sh show too much for that. So I'm just telling you. And this was, I know it's April because May, end of May is when we stopped shooting for the show. And we'd be off from May till September. And the producers and associate producers all still get paid. And believe me, we earned every second of that pay we didn't work. Every freaking second of that pay during the summer when we didn't have to go in that office but we still got that paycheck we earned it in those nine months that we worked so he looked at me i'll never, I'll never forget he squared the head goes what the f are you i don't know if i can swear on this but what the f are you talking about he goes you're not going to milk me for a paycheck all summer and then quit in september 
I'm like, dude, I would never do that. People do that. He's like, you yeah. don't know how freaking people have done that to me, Tony. He goes, I respect you. He goes, if you ever want to do anything with the show, in fact, you can provide people like you used to, and we'll pay you for that. But you know, I appreciate you telling me that, you know, and that you're that you're done. You were done anyways. He's like, dude, I was gonna fight you anyways. I'm like, hey man, <laughs> I was putting up bad shows. I know, I know. And, and the writing was on the wall, and I'm just telling you. So he's like, hey man, you know, I really respect that. And we were both Italian, and I come from a world like that, and like he was. So he's like, I you know, whatever you want to do. So I, I did that for about a year. And I found out Jimmy Sherlock, he was one of my good friends, left the show and they were looking for security. In fact, the reason I know that is because somebody called me and said, hey, don't, can you get me a job of security on the show? I'm like, nope. As soon as I, something clicked in my head, I'm like, dude, I, I'm, that's what I want to do, man. I'm a good looking dude. I'm a scrappy kid. I'll throw those people around on that stage. I'll, that's what I want to do. It'll be great for the show. So as soon yeah. as I got with the guy who asked me, Paul Richard, and he answered and I was like, what's going on? He's like, nothing. I go, hey, man, I know what I want to do. He goes, what? He goes, I want to be secure. I go, I, I want to be security on the show. And he's like, he, he just kind of like giggled a little bit. He goes, you know, those are all police officers. I was like, I know, but I'm telling you, you told me I could do whatever I wanted. I'm telling you, I want to do that. I'm scrappy and I'm good looking. Not to say nothing from nothing, but I was a little, you know, I was confident. I still am confident, but I, I would tell him, I was like, I'm going to be good for the show. I'm going to watch. I'm just telling you. He's like, dude, I love it. Come on. And Richard Dominic wasn't like that. I don't know if you know Richard at all. He was a scary dude, man. He was a very scary dude. I've and seen he, videos of him getting up on the stage when the guests were really out of control and he'd handle yeah. them himself, yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, for those of people that don't know him, he was the uh, executive producer. He was pretty much the one that brought Springer to where it was. They were going to cancel the show and he introduced the fighting and that was all his. They said, here you go. So, uh, you know, uh, he said, come on in. And I came in that Monday and they showed me around and Mike, Mike and uh, uh, Al was still there. They showed me around. They took me under their wing and uh, really uh, you know, told me what to do. Because a lot of people don't understand, like, uh, they just think it was all kind of like what we did was all kind of like, ah, whatever happens, you guys will handle it. There was a lot of talking, communication. There was a lot of, we had to work together. Everybody had to have their back. We were in a war up there, six of us against basically everybody. You know, the audience, the, the 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 guests, you know, if they, God forbid, they got together, especially those two groups, we were, in, it, we were in big trouble. And it wasn't like, it was big trouble. So we, you know, we had our sign languages, rings was a big thing. We had to watch out for rings. We had to watch out for nails. We had to watch out for pregnant girls. So we had to communicate like almost like a football team, you know, without yelling because we couldn't yell. Hey, we got, she's pregnant. You know what I mean? You just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Going on. So I was usually in the first, in the middle seat, because I was the first one up there usually. And then the two, you know, two, two people were here. And then we had two other people there and then two people, uh, one person back here. But again, I had to communicate. We had to communicate. So if we noticed nails, we'd go nails or, or rings, you know, watch it. You know what I mean? And um, so he showed me around and then that was it, man. Then I just kind of took it from there and ran with it, dude. I was, uh, I was the first bad boy on the bad boy show. You know what I mean? And I, and oh, I, yeah. and I, I played it up, bro. I, I just, I said, we need a bad boy. If we're going to be the bad boy show, there needs to be a bad boy on that show. And uh, yeah, Richard loved it, man. He really loved it. Well, it seems like when the sleeves came off of the shirt, that's when it really started. Cause I remember seeing shows with you, like where you still had like the button down security shirt yeah, and like your sleeves were shirt. still on. Yeah, the when the shirts team. came, the the sleeves came off. It was like game was on, and you and the guy, uh, was it Gabe? Both of yeah. you guys. It yeah. was like wow. It was, it was uh, the year after, but the year that I started it, and that's a pretty good story. I don't know if you want to how that. Oh, all I want to hear it all. I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> so again, I uh, I know what you know in my producer's head. I knew it was good for the show, even though I was tired of producing. I was a good producer when I put my mind to it. Because I knew what people would like in that world. Um, so when I was security, I like to wear sleeveless shirts. I do. You know what I mean? I worked out. I, I you know, I, I'm proud of what I did. You know, I, my, I don't have a body that's naturally awesome like some of these people that can eat anything. You're like, dude, man, I had to work at this. So, you know, I, I, I'm pride. You know, I, I take pride in that. So I wear a lot of shirts. I was thinking about it, it was Christmas break. We get Christmas off, too. And I looked at these shirts and I looked at my Springer shirts and I'm like, 
I'm going to cut their sleeves off and I'm going to walk in. They we come back. Let's see what Richard says. Richard was the end all be all. No one yeah. else, everybody else could say that they had power over there, but there ain't nobody that had power except for Richard Down. Jerry Springer was awesome. He was a great man, but he didn't have, he didn't know what was going on. Yeah. He didn't care what was going on. He didn't, he didn't have power, if you will. Like he didn't have any decision making, none, zero. He didn't hire and fire. He didn't do any of that. He didn't want to do any of that. He didn't have to do any of that. Yeah. So yeah. he didn't have any of that. No producing say. So he didn't, like I said, he didn't know what was going on. And that was part of the beauty of the show. Until yeah. he went out there, literally minutes, we'd tell him what basically was gonna. This is this person there. She's gonna be out there. She's gonna tell you this. Go, and he'd go, and he'd be awesome. So, um, so I walked in, had my sleeveless shirts on, shirt on, and it was a talk. There was a receptionist there, and she's like, "Look at you," and I'm like, "Yeah, I look good, right?" She's like, "Damn, you look good." So, I walked by, there, and then one person didn't particularly like it. Oh well, and he's like, "Don't wear it on the show." I'm like, okay. No problem, man. I won't wear it. But I knew it back in my head that I'm going to wear it around this office because Richard Dominic is going to see this and he's going to want it there. So sure enough, I was walking through the office probably about a half hour before the show was going to start. And he goes, Tom, come here. What the F did you do to that shirt? I could cut the sleeves off. He's like, I love it. Wear it on the show. All right, we'll do. And I thought to myself, awesome that's perfect so i didn't go around the person that told me not to do it because i want to see his reaction when i actually walked in with the shirt on just before the show was going to start and i walked in and then he's like i thought i told you to turn that shit to, to not wear that shirt in the show and i'm like yeah and then richard domino walked in he's like man i love that shirt that's gonna be awesome so i'm gonna like hey man i hate to tell you that's why I'm who was it. this guy who who didn't like it uh, my mom always told me not to talk about people that were not very good people. So we're just going to leave it at that. I just okay. All right. Good deal. Uh, good deal. Yeah. Um, but uh, then that started and I wore it. And uh, yeah, the fan mail started to come in. And, uh, you know, uh, Richard really started to play up to it. You know, he produced the show really from his podium, um, you know, got me involved with the shirts and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, got Andrew then. He said, Andrew, you're going to cut off your shirt sleeves. So then it became a thing. And then the next year, Gabe joined us. And Gabe and I were like brothers, dude. We were like, we, I, I was to him what Mike McDermott and, and, uh, and uh, Al were to me. Like, I, he came, he came from the producing world and came into, to, to uh, security. And I, when I walked in and he's like, I'm going to be security. I'm like, beautiful, dude. He's a good looking kid. I'm like, dude, we're going to rock this. We're going to be a team, man. It's going to be great. So, Show him around, told him our, you know, our, our stuff, and uh, he did really good. And we, uh, then he went, and then he was the me and him were like the main two that got these shirts going. And uh, after I introduced it all, and, and uh, it became a thing, man. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty cool. <laughs> and yeah. then funny to see because it was before the um, that show. What's it called? Jersey Shore. You remember right. Jersey Shore? Oh, I remember that. I was a teenager when that yeah, came out. For the sleeveless shirts and stuff like that, and the grease, and the grease back, and I still grease back. Um, I'm like, dude, you're just trying. You're, that's me. I, you guys are being me. That's me. It's you guys. Hey, you're taking it to a whole other level. But God bless you. But that's you that started was, it, you know, yeah. I, I, yeah, you know, I uh, in the daytime and that that reality world that was uh, my thing. You know what I mean? And it was cool that that moment in time where. In my head, I, I pictured it would when would go down. Actually, did go down. So, uh, yeah. So it brought me a lot of uh, fun things. It was, uh, like I said, I, in fact, not too long ago, somebody contacted me and asked me if I had any of these shirts laying around. I'm like, yeah, I got a couple. I had thousands of them, dude. I had like a whole freaking closet full of them, and I don't I only got like four of them now. But uh, I sent it to him. You know what I mean? He's like, hey, you mind if I had get one of them? Yeah, no problem. And I sent it to him in the mail. That's awesome. Now, that's yeah. cool. Well, I was going to ask, uh, did everybody, was everybody on the security team, like everybody like got along pretty well. They were like having each other's back. There was like a good, good group of guys you would say when you were on the show. And yeah, man, um, we all had, you know, most, yeah. Uh, 95% of us had each other's back. Good. And, uh, good. I would seriously to this day, um, I, I would go to war with those guys. They were if I was going to be in foxhole, there's a lot of those guys that, uh, uh, man, Dave Johnson, I don't know if you remember Dave Johnson. 
-hmm. He was literally, he was one of the original-ish guys. He wasn't the original, original, but he was one, I forgot to mention him. He was, he took me, he was like, these are my big brothers and I love them to death. And on that stage, I'm telling you, people don't understand the pressure that was on us. I thought producing had a lot of pressure and it did, but security was on a whole different level of pressure physical pressure that could change like that in an instant it could be on on and a lot of times we'd egg it not just not, we'd egg it on because that was made a good show we had to live on the edge we had to make it look really really good like a real fight but we had to make sure that people didn't get hurt man because that would be bad news you know so yeah. there was a real art real line that we Living on the edge, like I said, the pressure was on us, and there was no excuses. There was no excuses, Richard, Richard Dominic, whether you were producing the show, and I got to see both sides of it, whether it would be producing the show or security. Like, if I had a bad show, it wasn't like, well, this person didn't do what I told them to do, or they were like, what are you talking about? That's your fault. You're nobody else's fault. Mm -hmm. You're responsible for an hour of worldwide television a week. One hour. Make it happen no excuses don't tell me you can't get a segment or i don't have it there is no such thing like that there is no such thing in fact i my the show that i crapped out on my segment one so so segment one is your top segment man that's the one that's like yeah and then it goes two three four five usually there's sometimes five if you had five that was too many as far as i'm concerned three was probably a good well one or two of the stories would go double segments like so there'd be a commercial break and then come back those were good but this particular one, man, they, um, they, I had it all set up and they were, <laughs> it was a guy, and this was their business. They had human buffets. So he would send his chick out there and she'd put food on herself and these dudes would come up and eat it off her. So she, the story was they were going to bring this new girl up there and tell her, you know, she, her husband out there and say, okay, honey, this is what I want to do with my life and have her come out as a human buffet and have dudes start eating her off her. And he was going to go wild and beat up the dude, the other guy who had brought her into this and blah, blah, blah. And that was their business. It was their business. This is what they did for a living. So usually those are like, dude, they're on. They want to be on there. You know what I mean? So I had yeah. it all set up. I had it all set up and they, um, I couldn't find them the morning of the show. And I called the airlines and they had actually got on a plane and went back home. Oh, wow. It was the day of the show eight hours before the show was going to start i had to call rochelle rochelle was our coordinating producer and then she was the next up was richard i didn't want to call richard i'm like this is the only time i ever did this i'm like rochelle i don't have a segment one they left she goes i'll call richard she called me back she goes you better find a segment one <laughs> you got to find somebody to be human buffet in eight hours <laughs> so i ran on the columbus drive i'm like you want to be on the spring show you want to be on the spring show you want to be on the spring show <laughs> As many people as I could, and I finally found two that said they wanted to, and then they freaked out before the show. So there was a big to do backstage, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And that was the show again. It, they didn't care. They didn't care that I didn't have enough segment one. They said, "Go find one." Right. Find one. There was no excuses on on security. If somebody got hurt. If somebody did something that wasn't supposed to be done or whatever, there was no excuses. That was our fault. And, you know, that was a prestigious job. There was only a few people in this whole world that has ever done that job. And I loved the show. And it was more like, and I was, you know, I loved the popularity. And a lot of us did. Hey, listen, we are, we are motivated in life for different things. And being on that stage and being famous, if you will. Yeah, man. We all wanted to keep that. And the pay was great. I mean, it wasn't, it was, but. You didn't want to lose it, you know what I mean? And I yeah, yeah. personally didn't want to put the show in any trouble in, in, in any place that might, you know, be in trouble. So there was extra pressure. And boy, it it, it was palpable, man. Like you could feel it sometimes. Like um, so yeah, people didn't understand the pressure that we were under. And to uh, make it through all those years without any like major injuries that I know of, like in my time, I would have known them, but in my time there was one that was close um and i got suspended for a week for it what happened uh dude was as far as i can remember this was my first my second or third week on the show 
And one of the dude's brothers was there, which had no business being on that stage, being a security guard, to be honest with you. He had zero business being up there, zero, zero business being there. But anyway, he was up there, and his job was to take care of this pregnant girl. Don't let anybody find the pregnant girl. So we knew that she was pregnant, and that was big time. So I was holding the one dude who was the strongest dude up there, and there was another guy in there that had some kind of condition or something like that. I forget what it was, but he was off limits too. So he, this guy was in charge. He was standing in front of this guy. And then the pregnant girl was over there. Well, the one girl made a jump at the pregnant girl. And I got, I, I just wasn't seasoned enough or experienced enough to understand. All I saw was, I knew the pregnant girl was there. I knew the tough guy was here that I had to keep hold of. But I saw, and no one was on. I saw this girl make a beeline to the pregnant girl. And I was like, uh-oh. And then just instinctually, I went like that. And then old boy took off behind me and went full force like a football tackle. And this dude that had a condition and the guy who had no business being in that stage, let him go right by him and just tackle this dude. And I'll never forget. I looked over and I was like, hey, you have one job, dude. Don't let anybody buy this guy. And he went right by him. He didn't put his shoulder into him. He didn't get in front of him. He didn't do anything. And just took this guy out and went to the hospital. And boy, dude, I, uh, right after that show, I, I was like, dude, <laughs> we're all dead. I mean, we're not even getting fired. We're going to all die here. He's going to, Richard Thomas is going to kill us all. He's going to kill us. It was that, I mean, it was, it was, and so, you know, um, they said, you got, you can't can't leave that dude i'm like i know but he was cool. she was going for the pregnant girl i know i jumped i shouldn't have jumped take a week off think about it so i did and i came back and i learned from it and uh you know uh the guys man it was it's hard to explain the reason i was in the front seat is because i was like the hedge i was the uh, the wedge or the whatever you call it like and that's what i told richard i said i don't care how big these guys are. i don't care how big these dudes are and how wild up they are because i knew as a producer how wild up we get one of our tactics and i don't know if people went to the show know that they had to be there kind of early because you know you got to get the audience in blah, blah blah all that well the mm -hmm. guests get there even way earlier before that like hours before that we put, we put them in a little room and they cannot leave that room for anything nothing food nothing 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 and they get all riled up and people are like why do you and they used to why am i here eight hours before the show ah, we got to make sure you're here but it was to get them riled up dude it was to make them so they're like animals in a cage let me out of here let me out of here you know what i mean to get them all riled yeah. up get there so when they're out there not all the time some guys were little and there's a couple stories there's funny stories about that but they would come out and they would be like, you could tell. And, and then you, that's the one I saw one picture on you. I did go on it where you, I, I was like this in that center seat and Andrew was right next to me. I mean, when it was on, you like, I had to be focused and I had to look because you didn't know whether they, when they were going to jump, where they were going to jump, who was going to jump. But when right. they did, you had to, in a split second, be there. And again, let them blah, 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 but make sure that they didn't kill each other you know what i mean and break them up and then let them go again and break them up and there were some other things that the audience loved and richard would tell us we'd have to keep our eye on richard and he'd tell us what to do um but i was always the 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 guy so um to see that what i learned from watching that guy is don't let anybody run by me ever i don't care how big they are just get in front of them just do what you got to do. I played rugby in college. I played high school and uh, football in high school. So I was, a, I was, uh, I had been used, not used to that because no one really gets used to like hitting people, <laughs> making a tackle with no protection on. But uh, I told them, that's why I told them. And I became that, that, that wedge. And uh, that was, uh, that camaraderie was like, those guys knew their jobs were on the line all of our jobs were on the line. And when somebody like me takes it as seriously as I did and didn't let anybody do that, they had, they, there was a look like, thank, like, yes, we're in less. Yes. Yes. You are right for this. We need you up here, but we all needed everybody. I needed them, but I was proud. I, I was very um, honored that I did what I said I was going to do for them.
and uh, you know, um, you get up there and you make it look good, and you you jump in and you get your scrapes and your scraps and punch right in the nose sometimes, and you know what I mean, and you just kind of deal with it and uh, just make sure no one dies. <laughs> so, well, was there ever a lot from that? Yeah. Was there ever an incident where like a guest was so out of control that like he wanted to fight you guys and you guys had oh, to like oh, put yeah. him in check? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, not very often. Um, but more, more, I had a situation with an audience member more than anything. Uh, the guests were pretty cool. Usually there was a few couple stories. One story is this guy came out this guy was going to try and kill anybody. And this was the time that I think Richard saw and the guys on, you know, Mike and all those guys knew that I was in this for the long haul. I wasn't going to back down and they can, they could trust me. That's what it was more. I'm talking about. I, they could trust me more than that other dude who left. Cause he was, they couldn't, we couldn't trust him. He was no longer like, it's, I was just three weeks in. I'm like, dude, that can't be that guy. That, he can't be on stage, man. I can't watch my, I can't watch everything and, and be worried about him. Um, but uh, so he came out, he was the whole, man. he was, and he was foaming at the mouth. Like, I don't even, I don't remember what the story was. All the producers told us was there's a big dude coming out. I was like, and when somebody said that, a lot of eyes went on me. Like, you ready, Tone? I'm like, I, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's do it. This is what I live for. This is what I'm here to do. This is great. But when he came out, I'm like, damn, damn, what? Wait, I'm thinking to myself, wait, a I mean, this is cool and all. You'll have this. this is great. Yeah, you get a lot of fan mail, but uh, is this worth it right now? I mean, seriously, this guy came out. He was just 6'5, 290, just jacked. So, we stopped them, you know, we made our little, you know, we're lower than them. So that's good for leverage, but I didn't need to, again, you can't get up on stage too soon because you'll ruin the the moment. You know what I mean? Yes. Oh man, it was just reliving it. I remember how, how much of a thin line we had. So you couldn't get up too fast and you couldn't let this dude dive over you and kill anybody in the audience. So you had to be ready. And I remember, and Jerry, God love him, but he would, he, this wasn't even in the in the in the segment with the audience where the segment where they ask questions. He just said, "What do you want to talk?" He said, "You're a pussy." Blah, 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 to the dude on stage, I'm like, "What are you doing? What are you doing? Do you oh, see God. this man is just like huge? What are you doing?" But they had us, so they can you know, and they're gonna sit there on the Jerry Springer show, so they're gonna say everything and try and ink this guy on. I swear to God, he became a bull. His horns came out. <laughs> And he ran. I was like, oh crap. At that point, we were the stage was, like I said, about I don't know, three feet higher than we were, I guess, maybe four. When he started running, there's no way I could stay down there because I would he, there's no way he'd go right over me. So I had to jump. <laughs> and he went toward the stairs, stairs, because we had stairs on both sides of the, the stage. So I jumped up and I'm like, oh damn, and I hit him and it was like just like this and he was over the top of me and he picked me up like this and my feet were straight up in the air and he was like bang and he slammed me down on the stairs so my legs hit the stairs but all I kept saying is just hold on <laughs> just don't let him get him to this thing because we're all going to be fired so then I, I just got back up and then I had more leverage he gave me a little more leverage and I picked him up and I pushed him into the wall. I said, motherfucker, you do that again, I'm going to kill you. And I whispered, do it again, do it again. Because that was good TV, man. It's great TV as long as they don't get to each other. Um, so I then I kept him. I kept him there. I didn't let him get there. And we had to escort him to, after the, because this was a good segment. They're going to bring him out again. We had to escort him out to the back two sides of the stage is where they came in and out. So we had to squirt him back there. And the producers after that were going to talk to him. So I came back out and they were clapping. Like the audience was like, oh my God, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> Yay, Tony. I was like, yeah, y'all saw that. I got slammed down. <laughs> yeah. That's really like, again, that, that 
the trust was built, I think, in that moment in time, like really solidified. They all had saw seen, and I'm just talking, you know, that they had seen that I was, they could trust me out there. And uh, that was cool, man. That was cool. Um, as far as the audience member, the, the, so I was uh, during the question and answer for the for the uh, for the uh, at the end for the, the the audience, I moved from the center seat to the, the usually the left hand seat because I was there was the walkways there and that was I was able to the middle seat and then what wasn't as important because most of the time if they were going to try and get to the audience they'd run down those stairs. So then I'd switch over to the left hand seat. So I'm sitting there and again, you know, I, I and this is what I would do a lot. I wouldn't look behind me. I'd only look because that's what I had to worry about. If anybody was going to come from the audience or run up to the stage, somebody would let us know, you know, or, or one of the other. That's what these guys were for. They were to stop that. So I kept looking forward and, and Jerry is asking questions to the audience. He's like, yeah, no, nah, you got a question for somebody. And he goes, no, I got a question for that douchebag up there with the sleeveless shirts on. And I was like, sleeveless shirt on. I'm like, and I was the only one who and i look behind he's like yeah you pussy you think you're so tough come on come on so i started to get up and jerry's like no no and i look back and i'm like all right so i waited and i waited and i waited and i waited and as soon as the show was over i ran up there i was like what's up dude he's like oh you're a big pussy so i went like push him against the wall and i went like that and then all the guys grabbed me all the guys grabbed me and we took this guy back to the office into richard's office and I just love tough guys that are tough until <laughs> so they're like in the situation you're like, oh man. And we were like everybody was <laughs> and he's like, What? You're like, you're real tough, you're gonna you're picking one. And we were a brotherhood up there. Like you said, the ninety-five percent of us were a brotherhood. Like yeah. again, we trusted each other and we like I said, I want them in a foxhole with me. So they were all like, You if you want to fight him, you're gonna fight us all. You're gonna fight us all. What are you doing? And he's like, no, I'm so sorry. I'm just, I didn't mean it. It was just I wanted to be on TV. He just started crying. <laughs> like, dude, man, come on. I didn't even say anything. Your girl, you know, and his girlfriend, that we're losing it because his girlfriend was on, because I was like, come on, man, come on. And his girlfriend was like that. And I'm like, you don't let your girlfriend own your back. Come on, man. And that's when he kind of approached me. So that was the two times. One, one, and one time when I was a, uh, a producer, this dude, he didn't really fight me, but he wanted to outsmart, uh, not outsmart me. What's the word? Just be a jerk. Undermine in a way. I... Yeah, you know, there were rules on the show and people are, again, they were taken back when I tell them, like, you could, you should, you're not supposed to swear up there. They're like, dude, you hear beeps all the time. I'm like, I know, but we had to tell them don't swear. Don't use stupid sayings like uh, you can't turn a hole in a housewife or throw a hot dog down a hallway that stupid stuff you can't do that you can't there was all kinds of rules not all kinds but like five ten these are the no-no stay away from that so i had this girl come in she really wanted to come in i forget i forget what the story was or whatever and she and part of the process is being a producer we used to get we used to watching the show you'll see if you're a transsexual or if you're a blah, blah, and you want to do a call blah 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 so as a producer, you get two of those a week or uh, two subjects and you would put those on different shows and they would call those lines. And then you'd get about 1,500, 2,000 call messages for those. And then we had to call all of them back. You know what I mean? So um, we just, and we always worked to get the real stories. Uh, those were the best. So this one seemed to be real. And I you know, always had to tell the person who called in if they wanted to do it, okay. Well, do the other people in your story know this? And do they want to come? Well, you know, I've been like, well, I didn't really talk to them about it. I just didn't think you guys were going to call me back. So I'm like, well, you need to talk to them and see if yeah. they want to come to the show. Or, and then we might have something here. Well, can you talk to them? Yeah, I'll talk to them. So her boyfriend, and again, I don't know what the story was, but her boyfriend, and she was bringing her and telling her, oh, she was going to, she was with another couple, whatever. So I called the dude and I'm like, hey, this is Tony with the Jerry Springer. He goes, F you, click. <laughs> I was like, well, 
I, I called it back. I said, I don't think this is going to work, man. I don't think this dude's going to come to the show. So she talked to him and he reluctantly got on the phone with me and he's like, I'll come do your stupid show. I was like, oh boy. So I did get him here and uh, from Ohio. And he, uh, <laughs> I had never met him. I'd only seen him in pictures and he was grimy, bearded, long hair, like a biker dude. So I went to the executive plaza because they called me and said there was a problem. <laughs> Guess. And I'm like, uh. So I go to the hallway, they tell me, or the floor, they tell me, and this dude is banging on the door. And I'm like, this is this guy. I'm like, hey, doing whatever his name is, Bill. I just say his name is Bill. What's up, Bill? I'm telling you, that's up, you. I don't care who you are. I hate this. How are you doing this show? Just let's go. Let's get in the room. Then you're yelling in the middle of the hallway. Come on, let's go in the room. So you're in the room, and his girlfriend's on the cry. Ah! In the bed crying. I was like, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, you promised me a carriage ride. You guys promised me horse and buggy carriage. It was midnight. I was like, sweetie, I'm uh, trying. We're trying to find you a horse and buggy, but it's midnight. I mean, there's not that many around right now. How about a limo? We'll take a run. No, I want a horse and buggy. You give me a fucking horse and buggy or I'm not doing your show. Yeah. <laughs> So did she yeah, so, get her carriage ride? <laughs> uh, no, she did get a limo ride. So um, I looked down at that moment in time, and he was huffing and puffing like he wanted to fight me. And I was like, dude, I, I'm trying the best I can, man. Um, and I looked down, and there was cocaine on the on the table and some, and some weed. And back then, weed wasn't legal. And both of us kind of looked. You ever get the tongue moment of time when you both look at something and you know that you're in trouble when somebody's looking at something that you know that they shouldn't see. Well, that was him looking at me when I was like, dude, whose drugs are those? <laughs> Technically, this is my room. And you're doing drugs in my room? And he's like, oh, well, uh, yeah, nah, nah. you know, uh, we'll just maybe uh, limo. Can you get us a limo? And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, man, I told you I'd get you a limo. And she's like, I'll take a limo. <laughs> hey, man, you guys have a ball. I want you to have a good time. But, man, come on. You can't. Like, it's a limo. I'm trying the best. Okay. All right. And I knew, and he was seething because I, you know, I got him, per se. So, next day, show, begruntled. It's like five in the morning. I got him. And he's already riled up. And I'm telling him, you can't swear and you can't use those stupid things. You can't, oh, you can't threaten Jerry. You know, that was, you know, none of that stuff. Well, he did all of it. All of it. Every single thing that I told him not to do, he did. Oh, don't laugh. You know, I was big. Don't laugh during this a lot. So, he, and he was looking right at the camera. Like he was looking into my soul. Like he was like, <laughs> no, like, and Richard, as a producer, Richard's podium's here, and you stand behind the, the wall uh, where Todd is, you know, where Todd would be. That oh, yeah. area is, uh, or, I'm sorry, Richard's right here. And as a producer, you're right behind that wall watching it on a screen. And you can see Richard right there, and you just see him like this. <sighs> just getting more angry, and you're like, damn, I'm in trouble, too. And I'm in so much trouble because of that guy. Bad God. So after the show, I walked into his green room and he's just sitting there like it's real pompous, like he's got something on me. And I'm like, and I brought Al with me, his old security police officer. And I'm like, oh, good job out there. You did exactly what I told you not to do. And he's like, yeah. did you like that? And I was like, man, no, I'm in, I'm in big trouble. I'm, in fact, I might get fired for that. But the problem with this is, dude, these are your tickets home to fly on an airplane. The only tickets that exist for you to get on that airplane. Bye-bye. Get them out, Al. Threw them out. <laughs> Threw them out of NBC Towers. And I have no idea ever how they got home, whatever happened to them. I never, I don't know. I have no idea. But hey, man, <laughs> that's it. Oh, you, you, you know, that's with uh, the bull, I, you get the horns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was my fight name, by the way. Tony, oh, Bull. really? Nice. Um, yeah, so that was uh, the three incidents that I remember that like anybody had a, a beat.
beef with me other than like you know dudes the straight guys didn't like me too much because the girlfriends were always like mm, <laughs> well that was actually my next question is <laughs> how much uh attention from like female fans or even guests did, came oh, from yeah. this job oh yeah yeah oh yeah a uh, guy had a big huge women following and a uh, gay following those guys love me they love me so just so many fan mail and i used to i one of my things was i am i was uh excited to be up there again you know the fame got i mean the the fame right i mean jerry springer was famous but you know we're on tv what and you know people watch us so we had a degree of fame um it was cool but i never wanted i i just didn't feel like like if you were to take the time to write to me on like fan mail i was gonna write you back you know what i mean i was just like that's just courteous i was just right. i've been a courteous person so i would like the dude who sent me out of nowhere and said hey can you send me a shirt chair man whatever dude i'll send you a shirt um so yes man it was a lot of that it got to be more and more and more and more and more in fact to the point where i had a line that i was signing autographs after the show that was as long as some other you know it was a second line uh, it got to be close to almost the first longest line of people waiting for an autograph or a picture. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was cool. Uh, you know, it was like, uh, you know, I, you, you know, you think about it. Hey man, I'd love to have fan mail. Fan mail. That's awesome. And you got some, and a lot, I got a lot. In fact, I through that box. I, uh, I noticed that I had saved a few letters. So I was like, yeah, you know, just to prove that, Hey, I did get fan mail. Look here. I got it. Right, right. Well, a lot of people ask about you on the page. Like, I get private messages all the time. You got any Tony clips? You got any? And to be honest, like, they're very rare to find, even on YouTube. So when I do come across one, I'll screen record it and I'll put it on the page because I know that's what everybody wants to see. Everybody wants to see the seasons from, like, 2005 to, like, 2008. That's when they want to see the show. Yeah, man. And that's yeah, really I, when it was good, I, I think. Huh? That's really when it was good because when I went in Stanford, the security was a lot more. They didn't really let them fight too much. You know, they just, it was a couple punches and then they were, it was it, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. we used to throw down. They used to throw down. And if they didn't throw down, <laughs> me and Mike McDermott used to have this thing we do behind stage, backstage, if we two guys were like fighting, not very good, you know what I mean? So we'd be like, eh. And I'd hit him, and he'd hit me like, and I'd hit him. <laughs> Sometimes that's how the fights would be. But um, what we would do, and again, we had we had control over the show. So what we would do is this: we'd take him backstage, we'd cut, take him backstage, and they'd be standing there, and they'd be like, "Like, dude, you can you do better than that? Like, come on, man, get feisty out there." And like, yeah, yeah. I go, and then I, I figured out something to say to them that worked. I said, let me, I'm going to talk to you real now. Your friends are going to see this. Your family's going to see this. Your friend's friends are going to see this. Your family's friends are going to see this. And you're looking like a big wimp. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can swear. You don't no, you can. use that word, but a big, B-U-S-S, -S, you know, you're looking like a big pussy. Yeah. And then somebody on the other side would be saying something, the same thing to the other dude. Like, dude, you really want to go to Christmas this year and have them pull this thing up and see that? And it'd be like, and it would dawn on like, damn, this, they're right. And then you could see it in their eyes. It was, uh, <laughs> come out and be like, <sighs> before, like, <sighs> like, yeah. And then they'd be like, <laughs> and you get in there and put them up against the wall and be like, do it again, do it again. Yeah. And we'd back, be like, ah, oh, I told you not to do that. Do it again, do it again. The so, one that I saw recently was uh, it was one with these two brothers and they were really chubby and it was you and I believe Pete really like got to them. I mean, they were like because they threatened. Man, Pete and, was, yeah, Pete, Pete was strong. He was uh, he came uh, a little bit before I left the show and uh, he was a good dude, man. We uh, he was a cop and I worked on uh, the, in the Gold Coast at Melvin B's, which was his beat uh, called. It's called the Viagra Triangle in Chicago. And uh it's Rush Street, and uh, that was his beat. And uh, him and Jason Brandstetter. Yeah, he, he uh, 
Yeah, man, they were good dudes. They were good dudes. So he was strong. He was a, yeah, he was a, he was uh, strong to have up there. But yeah, he uh, he came in right after me. Yeah, we still communicate. He's uh, he lives in Hawaii now. Oh wow, awesome! Yeah, he, wow. he and his wife live out there. Cool, man. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I know he uh, he had something go on. I didn't. I don't remember it. something. Something happened. Oh, well, he got. He was shot. He was on the police department, and his uh, his neighbor. Uh, someone was breaking into his neighbor's house, and he walked over there, and the guy shot him, and he shot him four times, and he had to retire because it went in the bicep and came out the tricep. He had to retire. Yeah. So that's tough, man. Yeah. yeah, those guys. Uh, I respect that job. In fact, I, what I got, what I really left the show to do was go fight MMA, and I wanted to do it. Wanted to open up my own schools, and I did. And uh, a portion of my students still to this day are CPD and military, and I res respect those men and women. They put their life on the line every day, man. Every day. Yeah. Well, Jason Honor still them. works. Jason's still an active duty police officer, and he. Uh, he actually has a boxing training school, yeah. Gregory Boxing and Muay Thai. He does that now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He and I think I, I have met Mike. I've met Mike McDermott. Yeah. And uh I think he's retired now too. I could be wrong. God, we used to have some good times, me and that guy. Mike and I, he was like my older brother. And then Terry, Terry came in with me. He was the same year that I came in. So we were kind of like they were our bigger brothers. Terry was a good dude too. I love Terry. Yeah, Terry follows the page. Yeah, I'd love to talk to Terry as well. I bet that'd be yeah. good stories there too. T Dog, we used to call him T Dog. We had uh, good times on that show. We saw we uh, we were we were exposed to a lot of things that we didn't expect together, and uh, a lot of the pressures and like, whoa, <laughs> we didn't expect that. <laughs> yeah. But well, we both, what was? What about the the uncensored shows? I I've caught a few of those. I saw some. Uh, I saw one where you and Gabe gave these two ladies a a strip tease of sorts, and then I saw one where there was like a slip and slide. You guys were sliding across the stage. It looked like a lot of fun. Oh yeah, those uh, pay per views were. <laughs> they were like kids in a candy store for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, they were fun. They were uh, at night, so the audience was a, a lot rowdier, if you can imagine that, because most of the time the shows were either in early afternoon or late afternoon, if I remember correctly. Um, but these shows were done at night on purpose so that people could drink a little bit and, you know, be crazy. So the audience was crazy. And obviously the the guests were, and those producers, I'll tell you, I didn't ever produce those, one of those shows, but I know how hard they worked and I have mad respect for every producer and associate producer and that ever worked on that show. I don't care if it's been, it was a week or 10, 10 years. It's tough, man. That was a tough, tough job, man. Tough job. Tough. Well, didn't they try to do a reality show based off it called the Jerry Springer Hustle? Yeah, that was uh, VH1. And that was when I first started uh, training fighting. So they followed me around and it broke my toe when they were <laughs> oh, man. training. I was and looked down and my toe was sticking that way and I cracked it back and I had to be on the show. That, so I just taped it up and I felt like my great foot putting my shoe foot in the shoe but i went up there and did it man because uh, i wasn't there was no taking a day off as far as yeah. i'm concerned i can't say that. the only time that i that richard told me to go home was when my grandmother died and he said don't come in i'm like oh, no i'm coming and he goes tone you're staying home and when richard tells you to do something you do it so i said yes sir okay so that was the only time i missed a show um but i didn't miss anything i don't care if it was physical i had a lot of little stuff you know what i mean broken toes bruises cuts but nothing to stop you from being on that show man it was everything it was yeah yeah it was cool man it was uh it was cool we we're uh the, the whole group of people was like a big family because we were all under a lot of pressure every pretty much every job in there was pressure of some sort right um, so we all you know we all worked hard to make sure that everything went off without a hitch as much as we could yeah well, there was another episode that I saw, and that this has been viral on YouTube for a while. It was this uh, short, stocky, bald guy. He was a racist, and he and Gabe actually got into it a little bit, and then all you guys like jumped in there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's our brother, man. He's a, you. You say something to him, you say it to all of us. I remember that show, and uh, I told Gabe, "I got your back, man." I, listen, they say it to you. They say it to me. And uh, when I, you know, when that dude said that thing to me, Gabe wasn't, it was, I think the year before Gabe, Gabe was there, but 
all those other guys like dude if they threaten you they threaten all of us and uh yeah man that's we we backed them up we didn't care what color anybody was at least i didn't i don't care what color you are gabe was my man you know what i mean when he when he got pr promoted to producer i was like or uh, to security i was like heck yeah dude <laughs> let's go we're gonna be batman and robin and uh, we lived that life man there was <laughs> i lost my car <laughs> I swear it was stolen, but I think I just lost it one night. Just, uh, we, I forget what season it was, but we started and I went out with him one night and I just crashed into his house. He lived by Wrigley Field. I knew I shouldn't have parked by Wrigley Field. Stupid, the freaking Cub fans. I'm telling you, man, they're bad people. Bad. I'm a White Sox fan. So, so, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All my White Sox stuff. Also. Oh, very nice. Good stuff. That's a nice office you have, too. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's my place. So, um, yeah, so Gabe uh, uh, and I went out and, man, really got hammered and did some fun stuff. You know, people started to know us a little bit, especially us two. So, you know, we went out, we went out, and uh, I swear I parked my car. I looked up at the sign, the Wrigley Field sign. I'm like, hey, and I crashed. And I woke up the next day, and I was like, I went back to that same spot, and I was like, where is my car? Yeah. And I went to block over i went to the next block over and i called gabe i was like dude i lost my car <laughs> <laughs> i never found it <laughs> i never found the car ever was it know. a nice car or was it ah uh, yeah no whatever i don't know I, I, nice enough it drove <laughs> it yeah, yeah, yeah. but i don't know what happened to it <laughs> i really don't <laughs> to this day that car is somewhere out there no one knows <laughs> yeah who knows and um uh, it used to like bring people into the studio and stuff at night. I don't know if we were supposed to do that, but we were cool. Like I said, I was always courteous. And that's one thing about Jerry Springer. I was really impressed about that man. He is very famous, like rock star famous, but he would talk to everybody. I don't care if you were homeless or a president the same way. It was cool, man. It was like, and I used to tell him, cause I used to talk to Jerry before every show and I just, you know, just rap with them. And I was like, Jerry, I got to tell you something, man. You are very, like, down to earth with people. And that's so cool to see. He goes, I'm just grateful, man. I'm just grateful for all this, you know. I, I, and I thought that was, I thought that was really cool. And that's how I wanted to kind of present myself. But uh, we used to bring, so I was cool to the security people to the show of, of the building. So, you know, you meet some girls out at the club and you want to go to the Springer set. And they're like, come on we'll take you to the set right now you don't work for the show okay you never see never watch the show no so if you take them right in there <laughs> like what we do our thing right on the pole right there da, 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 da. and then i'd usually crash where those fan things were yeah back there was like padded i didn't know that until i one day i needed to crash and i was looking around and i didn't want to leave the studio because number one i don't think i could have found my car again but i was too drunk to drive anywhere so i found the padding by the the the, the great the, the fans and that's where i would crash nice. <laughs> first day i did it i'd come out and i was like they're getting the, sh the set ready and i was like, they're like where where did you come from i was like oh, i was back there i was sleeping <laughs> what <laughs> Like, yeah, we had a little party in here last night. So we just rather than drive home, I just stayed here. <laughs> okay. So you guys partied a lot like like when you weren't working with the other security guys? Uh was not there? no, because most of them were married. Yeah. <laughs> All those guys. I mean, I literally I was the bad boy. So I was the one who was partying and stuff. But Gabe, Gabe was younger and uh when he came in, we used to hang out a lot, yeah. Go out, me and him. But That's most of the other guys married. <laughs> so they were all the old guys. Our older brothers couldn't go with us. They had to go home to their wives. <laughs> yeah. Well, why uh, Why did you ever leave the show? What, was it just time? or? Yeah, you know, uh, things, jealousy happens with people, and I could feel it, and people were talking things, and I'm just not about that, and I, I don't play those games, and I wanted to fight, and I wanted to open my own gyms, and so I was like, I mean, I'm going to go. I'm just going to go and they're like what because there was big things supposed to happen you know with uh, me and stuff and i was just like i'm ready to move on you know i'm not i'm not that i'm not the type of person that goes he said she said stuff and there was a lot of that going on all of a sudden as i was moving up the ranks a little bit and 
I just didn't like that. So I just like, I'll go, man. I told Richard right to his face. I was like, I'm leaving the show. He's like, what? I was like, I'm leaving the show. I'm going to go fight. He's going to go, you're going to go do what? So I'm going to go fight. I'm going to go in a cage and see if I can handle that. And I want to open up schools. I don't know why. And uh, I did it. I walked away from it all. And people are like, dude. And I had dreams about it, like when I did it. And you're like, it gets inside of you and, and that, that reaction and, the, and, the, and the, the, you know, the, the pressure. So at night, I used to wake up out of my sleep because I'd be having a dream about two dudes on the Springer show getting, you know, charging each other. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night doing that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah. What do you think it would have eventually ended up you getting your own show? Who knows? I mean, who knows? Um, maybe. I don't know. I sometimes think about it, but uh, at the moment in time, it was the right thing to do, and uh, I did it. So I try not to look back and things like that, but uh, I don't know where it would have led. I don't. Well, it just wasn't meant to be. You know, everything happens for a reason. Yeah, yeah, man. I plus, I and then I met my wife, and to be honest with you, I think if I went down that road, <laughs> I wouldn't be married, and I wouldn't have kids now or anything. And I love my kids to death, and I love my wife, and I'm really glad I found her um but she knew about all this she you know she obviously knows about all this and she stayed with me anyways you know and she she i think maybe saw me on the show and she didn't meet me on the show but saw me on it because i when i first met her in person i'd already left the show um but i don't think i would have settled down i would have been a bad boy i would have kept being a bad boy and there's nobody that was going to settle me down it was just nobody there was nobody nobody <laughs> So, uh, you know, things happen for a reason. Maybe that's why, because I love my boys. I have two little boys, one three and one 16 months. And I know I'm too old for all that kind of stuff. But keep me young, man. I just trained today. So training keeps me young, too. Martial arts. Well, that's awesome. I mean, I, I think that's amazing. <clears throat> that you're able to do that and define that. And you yeah. can tell, like, she was really special if she was able to, you know, make you want to go down a different path. Right. Yeah, man. It was, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I guess it was, uh, it was yeah. a lot of people couldn't believe it because I had uh, started uh, a blog when I left the show. I had, a, I had quite a following. So uh, I kept it up for a while. I told them I would be married and boy, and like, yeah. you for real, you. And I was like, yeah, we'll see. And it's been 12 years. <laughs> Yeah, well, that that's awesome. That's so good. Um, so do you still do you still own the martial arts academy that you were talking about? Um, I, COVID took them from me, but I have a I I kept it going with my students in uh, in a park district. So uh, I do that. Uh, it's not as big as it was. It wasn't as full of a schedule, but I I do that, and then I make uh, custom cornhole boards nowadays, which is oh, that's interesting. awesome. Yeah, we uh, we went through a tornado. Um, father's day of 2021 um my neighborhood was uh i had just closed down my schools because of covid and i i was lost man i didn't know what i was gonna do and that's tough because my son was just born i'm like dude i got a son i gotta do something i gotta provide and i didn't know what to do and covid was went down so there was no you know nothing really going on and it was my second father's day and uh it was really bad and uh they said it wasn't going to be really bad, so I didn't take the proper precautions that I should have. And before I knew it, I looked out the window and there was an EF3 burned down on our house, like literally not two miles away, not a mile away, not 30, you know, uh, uh, half a mile away. It was coming down our block. And I looked at my wife, who just happened to come down because it was 11 o'clock, going, should we go downstairs? And I was like, no, nah, I shouldn't be. And I looked out that freaking window and I was like, uh, get down there. So I got my son down there and everything and everything was okay, but uh, we lost our garage. We lost our fence and we're the lucky ones. Most of my neighbors lost everything. Like their houses were gone. It was weird. It was like a bomb went out in our neighborhood. So uh, one of my jobs was to clean up all this so-called debris, which was a lot of like kids play sets, the wooden play sets you see uh, in backyards for kids. Oh yeah. About a two by four. Stuff like that and i was like dude there's got to be something better to do with these things there's got to be i can't because i was cutting them down to throw them away and i was like these are kids memories and i'm a environmentalist i love the environment and to throw this wood away was like heartbreaking to me 
know, my wife was like, what are you doing? I just kept bringing this wood into my garage that day, <laughs> the side of my house. She goes, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with this stuff, but I can't throw it away, man. Those are kids like memories there. I can't do that. Yeah. She's like, what are we going to do with all this crap? And I was like, I don't know. And she had just made a, a, a set for me, painted it. She's a really good artist, uh, white sock set. And I looked at it. I said, we're going to build cornhole boards with it. She's like, what? She had just painted it. She didn't build it. She's like, do, do, do you know how to build a cornhole board set? I'm like, I don't know how to build anything. Like I had a workbench in my, in my garage that sat there for years. I'm like, what do people do with this thing? Like, what do they do? I had tools. I'm like, I don't know what people do with these things. I never touched them. I'm like, I got that tool bench out there and I got those tools. I mean, figure it out. It's like YouTube it. I YouTubed it and I used the, um, the debris. I made cornhole board sets are beautiful and uh, I call them tornado boards and it turned into some, a little business now. So I've done, this is like, I've done like 50 sets now of different type things and all kinds of different stuff. That's awesome. So, I love, I love cornhole. I played a lot. I'm from uh, Southern Virginia originally. And that's like every family reunion, every wedding, there's cornhole. It's, it's just like a way of life. I'll send you some pictures of some of the stuff that we've done. These are, one of a kind. There's nothing like it out there, like the stuff that we do. Well, I might have to commission you for a Disney board. My girlfriend's huge Disney fan. She actually works for ABC, uh, the company that they own Disney or whatever. So she would yeah. she would love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like we a did. Disney board, <laughs> if that's possible. Yeah, just did, uh, I just did one that was a, was a CPD a guy was buying it for a guy who was. Um, Retired from the CPD and he had a dog. It's on his last day. He really loves the dog. He really loves the White Sox. And he loves like the um, uh, Field of Dreams game. In fact, he sent me the two pictures that this dude sent me was a picture of the dog and the picture of this guy with his family at the Field of Dream games with the White Sox versus the uh, Yankees, which I don't know how he got six tickets because there was only 8,000 tickets that were dropped. And dude, they were like high demand. So anyways, he must know somebody. So he sent me those two pictures of the iconic um uh bleachers and the house behind it and stuff of the field of dreams uh and he said you know do something and we did it all hand painted and i made a replica of the uh, scoreboard that's actually working you can actually write on it and change the scores and but it's made out of wood planks right and i just painted and i cut the wood planks at different so it looks like through the and then we put the clock on it i don't know if you remember the scoreboard it's got that white clock and stuff like that and uh, drew pictures of the dog. I took the family out of the picture and put the dog in the picture of him walking through the uh, uh, the cornfield and his dog waiting for him on the on the bleachers because he's retiring and his dog's there. So I, and then we put the other one. Uh, the White Sox have what is called dog days, so you can bring your dog to the game, and they put him in the left field bleachers. So we took we drew a picture of the left field bleachers with him and his dog there and on dog days and stuff like that. It really came out really killer, man. So came yeah, out so killer the game. The dude gave me a hundred bucks more than what I asked for. Oh, nice! Right. He must really like that. I mean, it sounds awesome. Yeah, I'd love to see a picture. Yeah. My wife is an unbelievable artist, and she's taught me a lot. So, well, that's that's, my... that's great. I'd I'd love to uh, I'd love to get one myself. Oh, that's a great picture. I don't know if you can see it real well with the light. Yeah, I can see it really well. And you said that was how many years ago? That was 2011, buddy. 2011. All right, I was. Uh, I was a senior in high school. <laughs> Bastard making me feel old. Senior in high school. Wow. You look pretty good, dude. Oh, well, well, thank you. I, I turned 30 next year, so I'm I'm young. <laughs> well, like I said, thank you so much for doing this. This has been a lot of fun for me. I hope it's been fun for you as well. I mean, these stories are awesome. I mean, and, you know, to be honest with you, like, I love Pete, but, like, you made that show. And when I find clips with you in it, they go on the page immediately and, and it gets the most engagement or with those posts. Oh, I'm serious. Awesome. People that's love it. I mean, they want to see it. And I really, my goal one day is to, get, my goal is to get NBC to give me like, or I can even buy it off of them. Some of those seasons of shows, because that's some uh, good stuff. Yeah. I, uh, I think people related to me because I was, um, I was the bad boy and I think that was intriguing to them, but I was, uh, I was down to earth, man. I wasn't like, I'm just not that type of person. You know what I mean? I was, 
I was, I'm confident. Like I said, I'm cocky, if you will. But I'm all, I'm never rude or anything like that. I always, I, you know, I, I, I respect people. And uh, I, I just, I, I, I again, I, I learned from Jerry Springer. I was like, dude, if that guy can be humble, I, I'll be humble. Like, I'm just grateful to have this opportunity. You know, it really, I told you, being one of those guys up there is a very small fraternity, very small. You know what I mean? If you think about it, there are yeah. jobs in this world that you look at only a few out of all the people in the world did. And that was one of them. And it got a lot of attention, which is great. But I was humble. I was like, dude, I'm just, that was, this is, I, I'm just, man, this is me. I'm, I'm like, Hey, uh, but I made it happen. I, I like I said, I, I started as a guest, and that day I looked at that set and I said, in my mind, I will be here one day in a bigger role than I am right now. I'll be here. I don't know how, but I'm gonna be here. And I just never stopped, and I just kept going, going, going. Um, so I think I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think I am the only person that to go from a guest to where I got. You know what I mean? I would believe I it. Yeah. I don't think there's anybody else that did that. Like everybody, as far as all this security, at least, you know, came from either people that knew each other or the police department or whatever. Yeah. Um, and producers, uh, I want to say maybe a couple people came from like guests. I think we did, you know, hire a couple people as producer, but I'm talking about a person that goes to be a producer and then be a guest, a producer, and then sp- security and then get to the levels that i got to with it i was like yeah this is cool like in my mind if i could have a dream about how this was gonna go this is how it was gonna go so it was yeah it was it was fun to live the dream you know it was fun to live that yeah well that's gonna cut off on us again any yeah. minute but I, my goal is to find that episode that you were on as a guest so that's gonna be my mission now Good. i'll try yeah. and give you dates at least i think it was 90 it gotta be 97 or 98 Okay. All right. Well, I'll be on the lookout for it. And uh, when I do, I'll post it. Oh my God. That would be awesome. That would be yeah, awesome. Man. That would be awesome. It's the one I pulled the, there's a racist guy and I pulled his uh, KKK mask off. Oh, nice. Was, All right. Well, that made it a little bit easier. Sit next to him and I yanked it off and then we 